Hey everyone, Gil Gross here, and it is time for another mailbag where I answer your observations, your complaints, your inquiries, your hot takes, and ultimately your comments on tennis and other things. About 24 hours ago, actually less, I posted in the YouTube community tab. I got some great comments there. Uh, because it was less time, I also posted on Twitter where you can follow me at Gil underscore Gross. So this week's mailbag is going to be a collection of uh, comments from the YouTube community tab and comments from Twitter. It is the year wrap up, the 2022 wrap up mailbag. I'm going to go for an hour, but I'm going to split it up into two parts. First part dropping now, obviously. Second part <laughs> will be uh, next Wednesday for um, so that we can kind of spread this out a little bit. And so that I can enjoy some time off next week while I work on the uh, MMA awards. So won't be fully off. Uh, all right. So let's get going. Um, let's start with VTech. Why was prize money for ATP finals so big? Uh, by the way, before I get into this question, let me just say uh, there's, a, there's a mix here. Some of them are topical questions that, you know, kind of go off what we saw last week, like this first one. Uh, a lot of the ones that I am that I ignored were like 2023 predictions, which it's not really what I'm going for right now. You know, we have plenty of time to talk about that over the course of the next month. Uh, but a lot of really, really good ones here. I'm excited to get into this. So yeah, first one. Uh, why was the prize money for ATP Finals so big? Djokovic got pretty much twice as much money as he did for winning Wimbledon. And I'm sure the broadcast money this tournament gets is nowhere near Wimbledon's. You would be correct. So there's a couple of factors that go into this. Uh, when you're talking about a major, there's just a lot of, first of all, prize money distribution that you're actually giving to entities that aren't necessarily undeserving of it, but they are net you know they're not net earners so uh you think about you think about the doubles you know the the mix the the wheelchair events right like they actually aren't earning money for the event but they are you know which is a good thing they're making money from it um so you know think of it like a like a subsidy uh basically that some of these events that we want in our sport need in our sport they belong there uh, they do need to be subsidized in order to survive and the majors actually have to do that where the the ATP finals you know and even singles this even applies to men's and women's singles a lot of the matches are not making the tournament money yet you need to staff it with umpires and lines judges and uh, ball kids and uh, court officials. And there's all of these overhead costs about keeping the grounds. These matches aren't actually making the tournament money in theory. Yes, maybe you're selling some grounds passes that account for that space on the grounds. But uh, do you know what I mean? There's all these things that majors actually have to subsidize. Uh, whereas this uh, year-end finals format, it's under one roof. You are... You know, you don't have any of that excess cost. And that is why I think all of the kind of the revenue can be focused uh, on the eight players. If you include doubles, uh, then you're up to 24 players who are participating. And that's why the prize money, same thing on the WTA side, although it's become a bit of a mess with Shenzhen being off the table now. Uh, that's why the prize money is so much higher for this format. It's just uh, lends itself to the players making more. This next one from Tarjus. What is the most improved serve, forehand, backhand of the season? I'll go, and I'm not thinking too hard about this, but I'll go serve, Runa, forehand, Fritz. Mm, that's tough. No, I'll say forehand Tiafo. Forehand Tiafo. Backhand Rude. From Omni, another Twitter question. Rafa mentioned in an interview that tennis isn't about tactics anymore. It's more like ending the point fast. Do you think we're going back to when tennis was serve dependent? Especially 
with most top players are big servers. Oh, wait. Uh, I don't know if this was worded correctly, but uh, especially when most of the top players are big servers and their game kind of collapses when the serve isn't working. I think we are going back to shorter points. I think the statistics fleshed that out. I mean, I know that I did look at this field and the only player who doesn't really serve huge was Rafa at this point. Uh, not that Djokovic and Rude, you know, they're both like players who are about six feet tall. Not that they're mega servers, but, you know, they're, they're, they are at this point dominant serve plus one players. And Nadal has increasingly become a serve plus one player. It does feel like the landscape of the tour has changed that way, uh, where... You know, you used to have, first of all, Nadal Djokovic playing a slightly different brand of tennis. Andy Murray was not about that serve plus one life. David Ferrer was not about that serve plus one life. Um, and th there are others, but I don't want to go through it. Yeah, I do think we, we hit a, a short kind of glimpse of those baseline grinders kind of having a moment there. Is that going the other direction? I think so. At the same time, I was talking to Joel Drucker about this, and he made a really good point. He he basically said, like, every single generation of players says this. You know, every aging player, and now Nadal is officially, I mean, most of the players Nadal's age are retired here. So, like, Nadal's generation is now the old generation. Most players look at the way the game is going and they think, oh, back in my day, it was better. There was more skill involved. There were more tactics involved. Uh, the the tour was, you know, we cared more. It wasn't as much about the money. Like there are all of these tropes that players tend to say about the younger generation. And I'm literally just repeating that from Joel. Joel, who, who knows because he has, you know, literally lived this and been interviewing these players throughout all of these generations. Um, however, even I can observe that that's true in so many walks of life from music to general culture. Uh, the older generation tends to look at the younger generation as inferior. So, uh, there might be a little bit of that coming from Rafa. Um, not that it's like bad, but maybe it's just kind of natural for him to feel that way. With that being said, I, I think there's a semblance of truth to it. This next one's from Cole. Hey, Gil, love the content. I appreciate you. Uh, my question is about Casper Rude. As you've mentioned before, he's been very consistent, but he seems to look a little bit flat against elite players on the biggest stages. We've seen some players in recent history like Medvedev against Djokovic in Cincy 2019 or team against Nadal in U.S. Open 2018 use these high-level performances on the biggest stages to vault into a new level from then on out. With that in mind, what do you think Rude needs to do to vault into that top level? And how can he be more competitive and start winning those matches against the top dogs? So, I, I, I think you make a good point. You're talking about two matches, Djokovic, um, or Medvedev against Djokovic and Cincy 2019, he won that match. Team against Nadal, US Open 2018, he actually lost that match. Um, but whether it's a win or a loss, when you go toe-to-toe -to -toe with these guys, it can really give you a new perspective on on who you can be as a player. You know, a newfound confidence, a newfound swagger. Like, I think it makes a big difference. Unfortunately, Rude hasn't had that experience yet for the most part. Whereas when he's found himself in these matches, he has not been able to really make them competitive. Uh, but my take on it, and I said this on Monday Match Analysis, is I don't think Rude has, has been technically ready to really compete with these guys. Uh, he's close. He's definitely, you know, in that tier below them. And maybe there's some, uh, maybe there's a little bit of inferiority complex. I do think that Rude mentally has been a slow developer. Not all that slow because he's in a really good place at 23 years old. But I felt like two years ago, his confidence was terribly fragile. And it's just gotten better and better and better. Maybe there is still that fragile confidence when he's going up against the best. I mean, I don't think he was aggressive enough against Djokovic in that ATP finals final uh, at all. And, you know, maybe that's like him not backing himself fully where he needs to kind of have an attitude of, wait, like I can do this and I can reach that level. I just need to trust myself to kind of, 
you know, let my hands go, let my shoulders loose and take bigger cuts at the ball. And I think if he did that, he would have had a better chance. Uh, so some of it might be mental, but I, I just think there are some, I mean, look, I talked about the backhand defense. I really think that needs to be better. I think the returning needs to be better on, on quick courts where, you know, he's, uh, you know, has the ability to be more aggressive on or hit more neutralizing first serve returns instead of having to defend on a surface like this. Uh, so there are just, you know, small areas. The transition game game can probably get better as well uh, with the volleys. Uh, there, there's, there's stuff. The court position, I think, can be a little bit sharper, uh, how he moves inside the court, because I feel like once he, once he moves back, he gets kind of stuck back. So the, there's a bunch of stuff. Here's the thing about Rude, though, his development, it's been really good. Like, he keeps getting better and better and better. So I don't think he's reached a point like some other guys where, you know, you're starting to get frustrated with their progress. With Rude, we shouldn't really be there at all. He's been improving very quickly. This next one comes from Abhishek, who is a member. Thank you for being a member. I give priorities to members in this mailbag. You can become a member by hitting the join button. It is $2 a month to support the channel. Hi, Gil. Why do you think Yannick Sinner's progress has been relatively slow compared to Alcaraz's? Is it because he's not a supreme athlete like Alcaraz, or is it something mental or a combination of both? What do you believe needs? What do you believe he needs to do to reach that next level? A couple things. First of all, I don't think it's mental. I just want to say that off the bat. I have nothing but great things to say about Yannick Sinner above the shoulders. It's mostly physical. Sinner is a normal person. He is not there yet. At his ripe age, no, sorry, not ripe age. At his underripe age, he has not uh he is not fully developed physically. At least, you know, that's what that's what I think. Uh meaning I believe he has more progress is to be made uh with Sinner physically. And, you know, he's always been kind of a guy who has been maturing slowly physically where, you know, he he was super wiry, very, very weak in the legs, you know, two years ago uh, compared to where he is now. But it's kind of slow and steady. Alcaraz just doesn't fit the normal mold of physical development. He, uh, first of all, was very physical even before this year, which some people like to ignore that fact. Um for some reason, but like his first ever ATP match was like three and a half hours against uh, Albert Ramos Vinolas in, in Rio. And I remember watching that. That was his first ever match. And I remember watching that thinking, whoa, this kid, this kid really has it athletically. Like the fact that he has not faded and that he still has energy is super different. And then lo and behold, you know, he takes that incredible stamina and endurance he ends up building muscle this offseason, and now he's a physical beast. So that's the biggest reason. Uh, I also think that Alcaraz, you know, he, he started earlier than Sinner. Sinner has, was kind of behind the eight ball as a junior, which has been well documented because he wasn't playing tennis seriously, you know, that early on. And that might be why some things look very natural and very pure to Alcaraz, like hitting drop shots and volleys and lobs and, uh, you know, touch defense and stuff. Where uh, for Sinner, it's a little bit more learned. And that's another reason why Alcaraz might be ahead of the Sinner curve. Hey, Gil. This is from channel name something. Okay. Very, uh, very vague. Hey, Gil, do you think it's time for everyone to reconsider the stereotype for what makes a good fast court player and what makes a good slow court player. Traditionally, it's been believed that fast courts reward all-out aggression and slow courts like clay reward consistency and an ability to grind. But isn't it true that the whole concept has been flipped on its head in recent times? Clay seems to reward aggression and variety. And you need to have an ability to hit through the opposition. And fast courts seem to favor players who, in fact, don't have a lot of power, like Medvedev, Di Minaur, etc. What are your thoughts on how tennis evolved on this front? Okay, then there's a part two of the question. I, do, I like the part two, too. I like the part two as well. So I'm going to get to that. But for this one, 
Yeah, it's just when you look at players, you know, surface suitability, you need to take a more nuanced view of it than a player is aggressive, likes quick courts, a player that is more defensive or not as aggressive, likes slow courts. If you take that kind of binary mentality or approach to it, you're going to be wrong all the time. You need to look at other factors. Uh, I'm going to highlight two of them. You know, the first thing is spin versus flat. That's a massive one. Flat hitters, better on quicker surfaces, lower bouncing surfaces, a surface where the ball is going to skid, where, you know, heavier topspin players are going to be better on grittier surfaces that tend to be slower, but also tend to bounce higher and tend to take to spin better. So one of it, you know, some of it is a spin thing. There's also a power versus precision thing. I think this is a major deal with Djokovic, who has plenty of power, uh, but in terms of, you know, where is he an A++, it's precision, not power. The power players find a larger advantage on the slower stuff because they can still hit through, they can still hit through it. Like, that is why Berrettini has a lot of advantages on the clay, for example. Team and Nadal have a lot of advantages on the clay. Uh, there is a lot of power there, and they're going to be able to hit through it. Uh, whereas some of the more uh, precision-oriented players, you know, Roger Federer and Djokovic would be an example, but I don't know if we can look to an extreme example like Adrian Manorino. He's a precision player, not a lot of power, but he's also not defensive. It's all about placement with him. It's where he puts the ball on the court. And a player like that is going to want a lot of court speed so that their muted power is going to be less of a liability where their precision is going to be more of a strength. So you just need to take a layered view to it if you want to kind of understand, you know, why players might be... Okay, Demonor is a guy. Demonor, you know, he takes the ball early, but he's not a power guy. He's a precision guy. And... um yeah, with Medvedev, you have the spin thing. You have a flat hitter there. So those are kind of the things you need to look at in addition to aggression versus defense. Like there are still some, you know, more defensive-minded players like a Zhao Mamunar who is going to defer, uh, prefer clay. But guess what? He hits heavy topspin. Um, so there's that. Second part of this. Also, speaking of court speed, did you find the ATP Finals enjoyable? The idea of fast courts always seemed alluring. You think you'll get to see variety, s and V, etc. But in truth, it just becomes totally serve-dominated with how big these guys serve these days. And it's just not all that engaging for me. What is the hard court tournament that totally got it right for you this year on tour, speed-wise, to make it entertaining? For me, it was the U.S. Open. I would agree with that. The U.S. Open courts tend to really be, I mean, just the last two years, I feel like it's been really, really good. Lots of winners. Aggression is being rewarded, but we're also getting breaks of serve. So I kind of agree with you where you're coming from on the ATP Finals. I think too fast is bad, and I think too slow is bad. And I know that goes against some of the sentiment that we have heard where there's been some complaints about how all the courts are homogenized and they're all medium now and you don't get those extremes. There have certainly been those complaints. But, I mean, I think, you know, you look at something like this, the ATP Finals, look, I felt that and I came in with a totally open mind, of course, but uh, sometimes it just felt like there there wasn't any suspense because the the holds of serve were too easy. I really don't have an issue with the rally length at all. Uh, the short rallies don't bother me. The serve and volley doesn't bother me. The serve plus one doesn't bother me. It's really like it's the 85% first serve points one numbers that we kept on seeing all week long that were just making it impossible for anybody to break serve. That definitely killed some of the suspense for me. There were a lot of matches that were like, wake me up when the tie break starts, not to quote Green Day, but that's kind of where I was at sometimes. And I don't really think that's really good. Then, you know, on the other end of things, when it's too slow, it can just be like, all right, nobody can hit a winner. Every point is kind of all about 
outlasting and these guys are just kind of it, it's a track meet there's not a lot of skill being showcased here it can be a slog the match takes very long like i think that can be an issue too like serves just aren't working they're not doing anything it doesn't matter how good one, how good your serve is i think that can also make for sometimes an arduous viewing experience. So while we like to complain or some like to complain about the kind of homogenized court speed, like maybe it is for the best. Another one from another member, Alex Ellis. Hey Gil, do you think the following changes will be good or bad for the pro tours? This will be a, a rapid fire one. Okay, first one, get rid of Davis Cup. Mm, wow, tough one. Oh, that's tough. Ultimately, I'm going to say good. Um, unless it reverted to the old format. I mean, I I don't see the appeal of Davis Cup if we're playing at neutral sites anymore. I, I, think, it, I think it destroys it. I, I do. So, you know, we have the United Cup. And, like, if that was kind of it, that would be fine with me. Although there's an interesting question coming up where I'll delve more into this. So... Wow, I, I didn't expect for that to be my answer, but that's I think that's what my heart is telling me right now, that it would be good to, to just scrap it. All right, two, combine the men's and women's tour final events. Same location, overlapping dates like at the Slams. Yes, that would be good. I would be for that. Uh, 3A, change the men's Grand Slams to best of three. Hell no. Uh, 3B, change women's Grand Slams to best of five. If the players are down, I'm down. If the players are down, I'm down with women playing best of five. Four, allow challenges slash video reviews for double bounces. Yes, they need to implement that. I mean, here's what will probably happen because this is how pathetic. Uh, I'm not singling out tennis here. All sports organizations tend to be pathetic in this area. You wait until something like this really hurts you, hurts the sport, happens in a big moment. I mean, you wait until it happens in a major final or a Masters 1000 final and, and swings the outcome of a match, and then you implement a change. That's what generally how this happens. But if you want to get ahead of this, this needs to happen right now. Video review for double bounces. It's a no-brainer. The technology is there, and we got to do it. All right, this one from South... How would you organize the World Cup of Tennis? So, first of all, the answer to this is I don't know. But it got me thinking. Why is the World Cup so special? And how come tennis doesn't have anything close to that? Besides for the fact that tennis is way less popular than football. Although, I learned on Twitter uh, this week that I could have called it soccer. I could have triggered some people, which is always fun. Uh, how would you organize? So, okay, so there's so there's a couple things, right? And I'm not really an, an expert on the World Cup at all, uh, although I do like it. Actually, I borderline love it. I'm very excited for it all the time. Um, so you have the every four years factor. And... You even take away the Olympics thing because it's just amateurs, right? Pros don't play Olympic soccer. So it's genuinely every four years, the World Cup. So you have scarcity, and that goes a really, really long way. Um, and, and I think that's the biggest thing, right? Like tennis, Davis Cup is every year. United Cup is going to be every year. And... I, I think that's the biggest difference. So in order to organize the World Cup of Tennis, you need to ax Billie Jean King Cup. You need to ax Davis Cup. You need to not let pros play in the Olympics. And then you need to organize something where, you know, I guess potentially on a neutral site, but but you kind of mark the hell out of it. It's like, okay, like, let's figure out. Let's figure out who the best tennis nations in the world are. Maybe do... You either combine it. I don't know if you'd combine it, men and women, or if you would do uh, a t every two-year thing. So you'd have, I mean, I guess it's like this in football, right? You have uh, you have the 
the Women's World Cup and the Men's World Cup, and you stagnate it every two years. Uh, but that's how you would have to do it. And honestly, I think it would be a big deal. But it's just, you know, we get oversaturated with with what we already have with all of these cups. This next one from Foot Fault Tennis, it's kind of in a similar vein. You can rebuild the tennis season however you see fit. What changes do you make? How long is the season? Do you change the ma uh, the majors? How many tournaments? What surfaces? Where? Well, uh, I mean, the biggest thing is, should the season be this long? And then, you know, it's such a tough question for me to answer. I think objectively, the answer, you know, from a fan's perspective is no. Like, we were just talking about scarcity with, you know, that makes the World Cup so special. If you made the season shorter, you would also kind of increase the scarcity. Uh, if you had more off weeks during the season, you would increase the scarcity. There would be a lot of benefits to that. The problem is uh, the economy of tennis makes it so that, first of all, uh, locally, it really helps that all of these different places around the world get tennis events. And uh, on the ground level, that's like an awesome and amazing thing. Now, you know, I grew up in New York, so my tennis tournament was the U.S. Open, which kind of skewed the way I experienced it. But I can imagine a lot of you guys out there, you know, you guys might have a 250, you guys might have even a Challenger or an ITF event. And, you know, how much can that, how much does that do for, you know, the local club that's hosting it uh, or for the the kids that can, you know, get in for 10 bucks or the kids that volunteer and become, you know, ball kids. So, you know, that's one thing that you don't want to lose. And then the second thing is uh, even like, even like freelancers, I mean, look, let's not ignore the reality of this, right? So like I am on a, again, I'm going to make this, I'm going to personalize this because uh, look, I know that also players hurting for money need to play every week. You know, that's just the tennis economy. But like, what about me? Like I'm doing a lot of my my work at my shifts at Tennis Channel or my weeks at Tennis Channel uh, because I'm the the new young guy. I'm doing it like the week after majors when not a lot of people are are kind of paying attention. It's kind of time to take a deep breath, right? A lot of those 250 weeks are the weeks that that I'm on. Uh, so you know it certainly helps me that we have a long season in, in in terms of that. So there's a lot of kind of benefits. It helps the I mean, I don't know like how many people watching this or listening to this are, are super, super happy about this. But uh, if you love to bet on tennis, it's always there. Uh, so I think as a sport that you can gamble on, one of the things that maybe tennis has profited on, maybe hasn't, I don't know, is the fact that it's always happening. Like if you're at work on a Tuesday and it's like 11 a.m., there's really no sports happening other than tennis. That has maybe worked to tennis's advantages in certain areas. So there's all of these different things that make it kind of good that tennis happens all the time. Uh, but that being said, here's my answer to this question. The season is at least a month and a half. It feels at least a month and a half too long. I think you have Australia in January. That's cool. You have kind of your Middle Eastern swing plus your golden swing in South America where you hit the indoor hard courts, the clay courts, that's cool. You do the sunshine double, then you go to Europe for the clay. Then you do Roland Garros, then you do the grass. Then you have a part of the season that can probably be cut. So here's how I would edit it. I would add some grass and take away all that post-Wimbledon clay and that weird, you know, Newport and stuff, nothing against... I'm not saying Newport shouldn't exist, but it shouldn't be after Roland Garros. Um, so basically, I would make make grass longer. I would cut that weird part of the season that doesn't make any sense. Then you go to the North American hard court, ideally, you know, right after Wimbledon, you know, without that weird part of the season. Then you have the U.S. Open. The, the two months after the U.S. Open the road to the year-end championships. It's too long. And geographically, I guess when it was the Asian swing, it made some sense. And I guess it still does. But it, it needs to be just that. So I say, you know, give... I, 
I'm not advocating for like short changing Asia, but you need to cut everything else that's not Asia after the US Open. And you know, I say do about a month in Asia and then you hit the year end championship. So I think the season is should probably be cut by five, six weeks. There should be some fat trimmed off of it. And that's kind of how I would change the schedule. All right. So that'll do it for part one. Part two will be coming up uh, next Wednesday.